We are fewer in numbers, but we are strong in the spirit this morning. Amen. Amen. Our call to worship is found in um, the Gospel of John, chapter 11. And in this passage, Jesus has just arrived in Bethany um, after Lazarus had died. Um, Verse 20 says, Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Jesus saith unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha saith unto him, I know he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he dead, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She saith unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Then when she had said so, she went her way and called Mary, her sister, secretly, saying, The Master is come and calleth for thee. Our song in the month, uh, this, um, this um, month of March, is, um, is one that's actually pretty dear to me. Um, it was one that my sister and I had chosen to be sung at my father's funeral 16 years ago. And it was also used as a witnessing opportunity um, when my childhood friend's dad was passing away from cancer just a a couple of years ago. Beck and I were um, even um, were even asked to sing it at his funeral, and um, and at the funeral there were dozens of uh, unbelieving family and friends um, that were present. It's a song of encouragement to the believer that death is only temporary, and when we have um, and and we have an eternal confidence that to be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. For the unbeliever, it's a presentation of the gospel and hope of eternal life in the face of spiritual death. All this because Jesus died on our behalf and rose again. Just like Jesus asked Martha in the scriptures that I read, do you believe it? The master has come and calleth for thee. Listen and respond and give God the glory. So let's, uh, let's stand together and sing our song of the month in Christ alone. We'll sing all four stanzas together. Yeah. 
welcome everyone to this uh, beginning snowy morning of, at Victory Baptist Church. Uh, I want you to close your eyes for two seconds and pretend you're at Palm Beach. <laughs> Lord, didn't work, did it? So, <laughs> anyway, we could wish, right? Anyways, what a blessing it is to be here and uh, just to kind of help everyone understand. So I think people know with the weather that we're supposed to have a little later today, actually around noon, it's supposed to really kick up. So we just uh, decided to just bump the service just a little earlier. So this is our normal Sunday school hour. John Ray made an interesting point when he came in. Also, the first thing he said to me, other than good morning, was, see, this goes to prove you can be here for Sunday school. So, <laughs> and, and the issue with that, talk to John. So, but anyway, so, what a blessing does it be here. This is Palm Sunday. Uh, the message we're going to be looking at a little later today, we're going to be looking at that event when Jesus came down the Mount of Olives, the triumphal entry. What a blessing that is. So I don't think there was a blizzard going on when Jesus did that. But uh, nonetheless, we're going to go... Uh, put ourselves in their sandals, so to speak, for that. I want to say, too, um, when he came in, hopefully he received a little handout. It was on the Welcome Center, uh, this song called Old Love Divine. We're going to be singing a little bit later on in the service, so if you did not get one of these, uh, maybe we could have one of our ushers go grab one, hand those out. So just raise your hand, and uh, we'll make sure you get a copy of that, because uh, we're going to sing that together here in just a little bit. But anyway, it's good to have everyone here today. Uh, just keep praying for one another. Pray that the Lord would just bless us today as we worship him. And uh, we just uh, praise the Lord for that. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this morning. Thank you for the opportunity it is just to worship you on this Palm Sunday, that the day uh, where uh, the people said, Hosanna, blessed is the son of David. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. So Lord, we pray that we would also have a heart of worship, a genuine worship to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So Father, just bless this hour. We pray for safety for, me, for those who are traveling right now, uh, for those who are away. We, Lord, we ask your blessings on them. But Lord, help us today to experience the warmth of your love and uh, your assurance of knowing who you are. So Father, we ask your blessing upon this time. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Let's continue our theme of Jesus' cleansing blood and turn to hymn number 188. 188, we're going to sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of At the Cross. Yeah. 
Good morning. Good to see all you early birds. <laughs> anyway, it looks like the weatherman may have got it right this time. They said it would start at 10 o'clock, and uh, by crack, he said about 10 o'clock, it started to snow, so I can't believe that maybe that this time they did hit it right. So anyway, uh, as Pastor was saying here, the reason why we're doing as we are this morning is just want to make sure that everybody stays safe. Didn't want to have church here and get out at, you know, 12 and... And if we do have what they're forecasting, why maybe slip and slide home. So this way, everybody gets to come and worship the Lord today, and you'll be able to get home safely. So no evening service tonight. Wednesday night, uh, the Purim party, we had to delay that, but that will be now this coming Wednesday night. Next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and uh, we'll be meeting at 9 o'clock. Davy is going to have some uh, refreshments for us, if you will, but uh, that will be at 9 o'clock. And then the following service, we'll be have, celebrating the uh, Lord's Supper here at church. So I think that is it outside of, we've been mentioning this here, the Ladies' Retreat coming up here in April the 12th uh, through the 13th. And if, ladies, if you want to attend that, be sure and talk to Mandy about that. She is sort of hitting that up. And then, folks, it's less than a month that our Prophecy Conference is coming April the 19th through the 21st, so be sure and get that on your schedule. That is always a well-spent couple of two or three days with Dr. Smith. So, thank you. I think um, it's natural for the believer to question how easy salvation really is when we recognize how sinful we are be before a righteous and holy God. Uh, you, might, you might say, surely there must be something more that I must do to be saved. But when we take his word seriously, we come to grips with the reality that um, it's simply and clearly taught in the scriptures. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Let's turn to hymn number 203 and let's sing, And Can It Be Together. Let's sing verses 1, 2, and 4 of this hymn as well. 203.
sing this one that Pastor mentioned earlier. It's one we've never sung as a congregation before. Um, but Becca and I did sing it as our first special music here at Victory Baptist Church a few years ago. And it's one of my favorite hymns. It's called A Love Divine. And it is that it inserts. Um, it's a fantastic, it has a fantastic message of the cross. And there's even a call um, on, uh, to action on verse 3. And before we sing, I'm going to ask Pastor to play it through entirely just once so that we can all become familiar with the melody before we join together and sing verse 1. So, Pastor.
All right, again, good morning, everyone. Again, it's good to be in the Lord's house this uh, snowy morning, so uh, praise God for that. One thing uh, it's important to know, you know, get out. At least you're not stuck out there, hopefully not. So if you go to a restaurant, it's on the waitress's fault, not on the preacher's fault, if you get stuck out in the blizzard. So <laughs> anyways, but what a blessing it is to be here and to worship the Lord. Just to, um, let's uh, give of our tithes and offerings at this time and just be thankful to Him. And again, looking forward to, to next week for the Easter celebration as well. And uh, looking at our risen Christ. So, what a blessing this is. We're going to ask Jerry Carlson if you go ahead and pray for the offering, please. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for all you do, Lord. Thank you for being able to get together and meet and worship you together, Lord. Lord, thank you for all you give us day in and day out. We don't deserve what you give us, but you always take care of us because you love us so much. Lord, just bless this time that we have the opportunity to give back to you. And rejoice, the Lord is King. It's kind of the theme of that. So, very good. All right. Uh, as far as junior church, I think we'll just be a cozy group. Is that all right? Or okay, all right, good. Just don't want to double check on that. All right. Well, again, what a blessing it is to be here this day on this Sunday. This is Palm Sunday. It's traditionally celebrated, and uh, what a blessing it is to see. Um, uh, this is one of my favorite days of the year. Uh, religiously speaking, of course, on the calendar, as we look at what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross, and really it started with what we call the Passion Week, the Passion of the Christ, and that started really on this day, on Palm Sunday. So what a blessing it is. So I invite you to turn in your Bibles this with me this morning to the book of Matthew chapter 21. Matthew chapter 21. And the one thing that's interesting with the accounts that we have, uh, the, the mention of the triumphal entry is actually mentioned uh, in each of the four Gospels, and so that is uh, important to understand. So when you have events, things like that, uh, that take place, it's, it's worth noting. There's a reason for that. And actually, the vast majority of the Gospels is focused, focused really on the last week of Christ, uh, as far as Palm Sunday and then going into, um, uh, of course, uh, the uh, up, upper room, and then going to Gethsemane, and then eventually, of course, to the cross and the resurrection. So a uh, large chunk of that. So in other words, the gospel writers put a great emphasis and detail in the writing, so I think it's worth noting. And so to, uh, today, we're going to be looking at one of the accounts in Matthew 21 in regards to uh, Palm Sunday. And so once you find your place there, let's stand for the reading of God's Word, if you're able. Matthew 21, and we're going to read through this passage, verses 1 through 11. Follow along as I read. And when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, were come to Bethpage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples, saying unto them, 
Go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find an ass tied and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. If any man say aught unto you, you shall say, The Lord hath need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell ye the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass, and the colt the full of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. And brought the ass and the colt, and put them on their clothes, and, and they set them thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees, and strewed them in the way. And the multitudes that went before, and that followed, cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he was come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Again, what a blessed moment that is. If you had to just pinch yourself to be in a, in a location for a, in, a, in the Bible times, I think this would definitely be one up there. This would be a very exciting time to be at. So we're going to look at the triumphal entry, and the title of the message is, The King is Coming. We're going to see Jesus presented as the King of Israel. So let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for your blessings and uh, in your mercy, Lord, that is upon us daily. Lord, I just uh, ask now that as we look into your word and look at this significant event that occurred uh, 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, Lord, we pray that uh, we would be in awe of the Messiah, Jesus, and we pray that we would worship him and say that, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. May we do it from a worshipful heart, Lord, and seeing what you would do for us on the cross to free us from sin. Lord, I pray that you just bless this time now. Bless your word, bless the preacher, the preaching of it, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So again, this Sunday is traditionally noted as, as Palm Sunday, and so next week we'll, of course, be focusing on the resurrection. Uh, next week, we'll be, the service will be a little different. We were going to do the Lord's Supper today, but because of the change in schedule and things going on, we're going to move the Lord's Supper uh, celebration to next Sunday, and the service will look maybe just a little bit different because of that. Uh, we're going to focus uh, on the cross, definitely, but we're also going to focus on the resurrection, and kind of in between that, we're going to have the Lord's Supper, and so I think it'll be a blessed time to, to, uh, then as we do that. But uh, as we think about that, Palm Sunday, as I mentioned before, is mentioned in each of the four Gospels, and because of that is significant. And uh, one thing that I want us to think about even now as we get into the text is that the, the triumphal entry, or Palm Sunday, it really is a contrast. It's really a scene of contrast. And what we should come out with it is this, that it should reveal the character of Jesus, the coming King Messiah. And so that's kind of the focus of the triumphal entry is, yes, there's a lot happening. There's, there's multitudes. There's a feast going on. There's, we're going to kind of dig into all that. There's a lot of activity going on in this passage of Scripture. And I think it's easy to kind of look over the central figure of the triumphal entry, and that's Jesus the Messiah. And so that's kind of our, our focus. And so I challenge us today as we look through this text to do a couple things. Look carefully, observe, listen, listen to what's being said, and then eventually believe in the coming king. Believe in Jesus, the coming king. And so we are going to be focusing today on Palm Sunday. So uh, this morning in Jerusalem, uh, there was a, a march, a procession similar to what you see here. And uh, obviously with the situation that's going on in Israel with the current crisis, the, the tourist numbers Aren't, aren't great. There's very little tourism going on in Israel right now, but still there are locals and, and others who do participate in, in the march. One thing I did a little digging on is uh, that the, when did this tradition get started of having this processional? We, we think of, of course, what happens in Jesus. We'll look at the, 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 the contrast and the, the background that's going on there, but how did this tradition get started of us this yearly event going down the Mount of Olives? And uh, by the way, you can go on YouTube if you want a special link. I can point you to a tour guide that he kind of walks with the group. I think today he did it in like about an hour and 15 minutes. And so you start actually in Bethpage, where we're, that's in verse 1 there, we'll, and we'll go there in just a second. And then you go down the Mount of Olives, uh, and eventually through past the Garden of Gethsemane, and you eventually go across the Kidron Valley, and then you enter into St. Stephen's Gate or the Lion's Gate, 
uh, and that is very close to where the Pools of Bethesda is located. So that's kind of where it ends, uh, the procession. So it's about an hour, an hour and a half, just depending on where you go and how crazy and animated people get. Okay, that's kind of what to expect when you go on this. But uh, so there's a lot of different traditions of when this got started. Some say it goes back to the Crusader time, which it did. But there's actually records that uh, this procession of the, uh, the Palm Sunday March in Jerusalem, uh, there's even records from the, the, uh, the late 3rd century. So like the 300s, late 300s, uh, there was even some processions that were taking place. More so at the top of the Mount of coming on. But now I think it's since the Crusader time uh, or the 900s at least that the tradition actually starts in Bethpage and then makes its way down. And say, well, what does that mean? I've never been there, all that. We're talking a very short distance from Bethpage to Jerusalem is about maybe a, a mile and a half, maybe. Uh, but it's a very uh, interesting way. And let me show you a map just to kind of illustrate where we're looking at. And so uh, where this area is, Mount of Olives, is a, is a ridge. It's part of a ridge system that's there. And so obviously west of the Mount of Olives is the is the uh, Jerusalem, the old city, the Temple Mount's there. You have the Kidron Valley. You see the Garden of Gethsemane there. And so you have this high peak of the Mount of Olives. And just over the crest going east of the Mount of Olives, you come to Bethpage. And then you go down a little bit farther south, not very far, maybe about, uh, I don't know, two-fifths of a mile maybe, you, you come to Bethany. It's a very short distance. And Bethany, of course, we know that this is the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And we know that actually... Um, and this is actually going to play very significant in what's going to be presented in Jesus in a moment. Bethany, this is the, the place or the hiding place, if you will, of Jesus. Um, and so remember that on, in John's gospel, you see it a little bit more succinct in this, that uh, you find Jesus uh, celebrating or having the Sabbath in Bethany with Mary and Martha, Lazarus. That's when Mary comes and anoints Jesus' feet, uh, where this event happens, okay? And so the next day, it's that Sunday, it's the 10th day of the month Nisan on the Jewish calendar. So on that Sunday, that's when Jesus makes this triumphal entry into Jerusalem. So he starts from Bethany and he goes to Bethpage and that's where he uh, gets on the donkey. So kind of, let's focus here in verse uh, 1, We're going back to the text here. It says, and when they drew nigh unto Jerusalem, they were come to Bethpage. So if you compare the other gospel writings, I encourage you to do that. Look at each of the gospel writings. If you want something to do during the blizzard this afternoon, uh, read each of the four accounts of the triumphal entry. I think you're going to be blessed. But we're looking at one specifically. Okay, but they come from Bethany and they come to Bethpage, okay? Bethpage is uh, it's called, the, uh, the transliteration is the house of unripened figs. The house of unripened figs, which that actually is kind of interesting because skip down to verse 17 of this passage, and what's happening? They left them and they went, this is like probably the next day, like that Monday or maybe Tuesday even of the Passion Week, and he left them and they went out of the city into Bethany, lodged there, and then anyways, they looked upon that fig tree that was didn't bear any fruit. So Bethpage, the house of unripened figs, kind of has that word play. Anyways, it is to Bethpage though, that there is a, a chapel that's there. Um, the, one, the building you see there is from the Crusader times. What does that mean? A thousand years ago, just about. Okay, almost a thousand years ago. So this, this chapel is there, this church, and so it's the, basically the church of Bethpage, or I'm going to call it, make it real simple for the tourists that are out there. It's the church of the donkey, all right? There's, and when you go to Israel, you find there's a church for everything. Okay, there's a, there's, okay we could go all day on that, and literally you could. And then the next day, but this is basically the church of the donkey. Why do we say that? Because this is the place where Jesus got on that donkey and started making his way down the Mount of Olives, okay? And so this is very important. So if you go inside this church, it's a small chapel, and uh, there is a mosaic that's, or not a mosaic, a, a painting, artwork that's in the, the asp of the church uh, behind the altar, and you see it right here behind me, and you can see Jesus getting on that donkey. And this is where he officially begins his, his journey. So going back to the map here, the triumphal entry. Uh, so you see from Bethany, he comes up just up the hill. It's in a steep climb, by the way. You get a workout. You don't need to go to the gym that day if you do this ridge route, okay? You stop in Bethpage, and that's where Jesus gets on the donkey. So the, the procession that occurs and has been occurring for centuries begins at that spot in, in Bethpage. So that's very important to, to know that. Okay, so what happens is this. We know in the account that Jesus tells his, two of his disciples, 
I don't know who, which ones. Uh, I, I, put your guess. There's 12 of them to pick from, right? So anyways, they're out there, and they say, they're supposed to go to the village over against you. That's Bethpage. Okay, and they were supposed to find basically a donkey with a colt. And so anyways, the Lord needs them. So it's interesting, even there, there's that tension in that story, because if you read the other Gospels, there were some that asked, um, Jesus alludes to it in verse 3, if any man say odd against you, or they object, say the Lord hath need of him, and straightway they will lend him. And that's kind of what happened. Just as Jesus said, there was someone who said, what are you doing with these, these donkeys? What are you doing with my donkeys, right? <laughs> and, G, and they said, the Lord needs them, Jesus needs them. And that was understood, and so Jesus knew Everything now. This is a donkey, and, and that had never been ridden before, if you compare to the other accounts. And so, uh, who was I talking? I think a skip. I was talking to last week. We were talking about sheep. We're done with sheep now, and then we were talking about donkeys. Have you ever tried to ride a donkey before? Anyone tried to ride a donkey? No one wants to try, right? Okay, skip has. How was that? How was that experience? <laughs> Right from the, no, not the horse's mouth. The dog. Okay, anyways, moving on. <laughs> so when we think about that, uh, this is donkey never been ridden. You probably don't want for your very first time to, to ride a donkey like that. So very, very interesting to keep that in mind uh, as we think about that. So obviously, could Jesus himself have control over the beast that he was riding on? Absolutely. So it, it was no problem at all. But nonetheless, why did Jesus do that? Why did Jesus do that? It's because in verse 4, it says, And this was done that might be fulfilled, which is spoken by the prophet, saying, Tell you the daughter of Zion, behold, the king cometh unto thee, meek and sitting upon an ass that called the full of an ass. So that's from Zechariah 9. So, so that's kind of setting the stage of what's happening. So let's do just a little bit of a background. on the, This is what I call the first Palm Sunday. The first Palm Sunday. Again, about 2,000 years ago. So keep in mind, why was Jesus doing this? This is, again, the beginning of what we refer to as the Passion Week. But Jesus' focus was really on this. Jesus was focused on doing the will of the Father, that he came to this world to save sinners, that which was lost. But look with me in Matthew chapter 20, just the next chapter back. In Matthew chapter 20, beginning in verse um, 17. Let's look at there. Just a couple verses. And Jesus going up to Jerusalem took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and to the scribes, and they shall condemn him to, to death, and shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge him to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. So Jesus tells the disciples, actually this is the third time, if you look at Mark's Gospel, Mark 10, 32, and you read this, that the Gospels mention that Jesus here told his disciples now three times that he was going to go to Jerusalem and suffer. He would, he would suffer at, at, the, at these people's hands. Okay, and so actually Mark's Gospel actually puts another layer onto that. Actually, it's kind of interesting. Look with me over there. Mark chapter 10. This is interesting. Mark 10 verse 32. Okay, and this is this passage here, verse 32 to 34, is very similar to what we read in, in Matthew's gospel. But look with me in verse 32 what it says. And they were in the way going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus went before them, and they were amazed. Okay, now he sets aside in Jerusalem. And they followed, and they were afraid, the disciples. And he took again the twelve and began to tell them what things should happen unto them. So the disciples were a little bit unnerved. They were a little bit afraid, even as Jesus told them that they're going to go to Jerusalem. Why was that? Because here we are at the end of Jesus' ministry. And one thing you're going to see in Jesus' ministry, I think probably the breaking point was at the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, and a little bit after that, that the crowds that came by the thousands, now they were dwindling because uh, the hard sayings of Jesus, if you will, and there was kind of this little break, if you will, of uh, people's relationship with them. But Jesus was more or less a wanted man. That was happening. Jesus was a wanted man because they said he cannot, st he cannot be here. Uh, so they, they were, uh, in fact, there was a price on his head. So that's something very important to understand that. So that's in Mark's gospel. So keep that in mind. So as Jesus is coming and then he spends his time in Bethany with uh, Mary and Martha and Lazarus. And now what we're seeing is this. They come into Jerusalem and this is a very special time. 
Uh, this was the beginning of the Passover season. So people's reaction to the triumphal entry was festive as they're coming in. Look with me now in verse, uh, going back to Matthew 21. Uh, let's say they put Jesus on, on the donkey and then verse, uh, verse 8. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down the branches from the trees and strewed them away. And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So, kind of interesting what's going on here. So, what's the people's reaction to Jesus coming down uh, the, the Mount of Olives? Okay? So, remember, this was Passover. And so Passover season was about to happen that weekend, that Friday, Saturday, okay, that, that was the Passover weekend that, that was about to happen. We know Jesus celebrated the Passover with his disciples in the upper room just in a couple days. So we know that. So this is very important as we see that. So it's a festive time. According to Josephus and other historians, that they believe that Jerusalem swelled about three times its normal size during this because you had throngs of people. Remember this, that God commanded the Jewish people, the men, to come three times a year, to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. And the three times were Passover, Shavuot, which is the Feast of Pentecost, and then Sukkot, which is the Feast of Tabernacles that was in the fall. So three times a year they had to come. And so Passover was a great time. And remember this too, what was so significant about Passover? Uh, Now coming up in in April, end of April, we're going to do our Passover Seder that we normally do. And uh, so we will be reliving that. But Passover is really about freedom, right? Uh, it was about freedom from oppression, freedom from slavery that the children of Israel experienced from their e- Egypt. Now Israel is under a different oppressor, a different taskmaster, if you will, and that was the Romans. And they were crying out for a deliverer. Now the Romans were definitely on guard. You know, they were looking for any seditionists. Uh, and there's a lot of historical accounts of uh, those who dare rise up against Rome to try to become the new king, if you will. And so the Romans were very on edge, especially during this time. So, but nonetheless, this is a festive time. And so, but for the Jewish people, what a, a proper time it would be for a Messiah to come and present himself and to rid them of the bondage of Rome. That's, that was on their minds. And so what do we see here? That they cut down branches, and we know from other gospel accounts that these are palm branches. They put them down, but they also waved them. We know that. And the palm branches, remember this, that these served as the Israeli flag of the day. The palm branches were the Israeli flag of the day. This is what the zealots would use. And so there was actually periods of time in Roman history where they actually forbid the use of palm branches, you know, in decorations and all that because of that. So this was the Israeli flag of the day, okay? Also, the people shouted, they cried out, Hosanna! They cried out, Hosanna! And what does Hosanna mean? This is a word we say uh, right now, obviously, this Palm Sunday. We're familiar with it, but what does this mean? What does it mean, Hosanna, Hosanna to the Son of David? Hosanna actually is a Hebrew or slash Aramaic word put together, and in Hebrew you would say it, Hoshia'ana, Hoshia'ana. And it means this, save us now. Save us now. It was, save us, rescue us. It was a rallying cry. I tell you what, anytime there's an election process going on, we basically say the same thing, just not in Hebrew. <laughs> We're saying, rescue us, save us, whoever we elect, whatever party, whatever you put in, whatever figure you want. We're crying out for the same thing, more or less. People are. It doesn't matter what part of the aisle you're on. But that's, that's the rallying cry at every election. But as we see this, this is actually from Scripture. In the book of Psalms, chapter 118 uh, there's a couple verses there. In verse 24 and 25, it says, Save us now, or Hosanna, Hoshiana. I beseech thee, O Lord, or, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. So what the people are saying here in verse uh, 9 is exactly that. They are basically having this rallying cry for the Messiah. In particular, during the Feast of Israel, whether it be Passover or Pentecost or Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, that this was a rallying cry for the Jewish people. As they would come to worship the Lord in the temple, they would be singing these songs. This was a common phrase, but even now it gained more excitement as Jesus was coming down the Mount of Olives on the donkey. Palm branches are waving, the flags are waving, save us now. This is a rally cry. This was a political rally in the Jewish people's mind. This is, I want you to kind of get that, that impression of what's happening. The people cried, Hoshiana. By the way, let me 
switch the wording just slightly. It's, it's the same root in Hebrew. But Hoshiana, what is they're saying is save us now, but Hoshiana or literally Yeshua na. Yeshua na. Yeshua is the Hebrew word for Jesus. And na means now. Okay? Hoshia na. Jesus now. That's what they were saying. But it was basically kind of a chant. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's what was going on. So it was a fever pitch. I mean, talk about being enwrapped in that, uh, that throng. What a, what a kind of an amazing, amazing time that would be. Then they said, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That was a common greeting and still is even till this day in Jewish society. Uh, having that, that, that phrase. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Jesus said... He said this a little bit later when he read later on in Matthew. You shall not see me henceforth until you say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Yes, they said it here, but again, this was more of a political rallying cry. What this was about is this. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. This was a welcoming of the Messiah. That when the Messiah appears in full glory, in full power, in full majesty, that we can do nothing but nothing but Say, Baruch Abab Hashem Adonai, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So this is, this is kind of what's, this is, this is amazing. Now, let's talk about this. What was the uh, religious leader's uh, response? They were upset at the triumphal entry. Okay? They, in, uh, in Luke's gospel, Luke 19, they asked Jesus' disciples, tell your disciples to be quiet. Tell them to hush it. Why? And, and Jesus said, if these hold their peace, what do you say? The very stones are going to cry out, okay? In other words, there was an immense thing going on there. Why were the religious leaders upset at this? They were in fear of Rome. That was part of it. But also they were in fear of losing their own power. Put it this way, in, uh, in that system there, if there was a Messiah, and I even challenge my Jewish friends, especially my religious Jewish friends today, if the Messiah actually comes, there is a belief, general belief of a Messiah, but if the Messiah actually comes... What would happen to all the, the rules, if you will? There, there's what we call the three legs of Judaism, which is the, the temple, the priests, and the sacrifices. That's, when you look at Old Testament uh, Judaism, biblical Judaism, those are what we call the three legs of Judaism, the temple, the priests, and the sacrifices. But since the temple was destroyed in the year 70, none of those things remain. Everything had to be, if you want to say, a new law, a new logos, if you will, a new word that has come in. And so that has been replaced now by rabbinic Judaism. And so there's something, something amiss. And so in doing that, they would lose their power. And so there is, there is a small group, even within Israel, that are waiting for a coming Messiah. They proclaim that. But I'll be honest with you, that would totally upset the apple cart from the system that they have right now. It's very interesting to see that play out. And so, do we really want a Messiah? There's, a, there's an old saying this, that people are okay with change and until it affects you. Okay? And so, that's kind of what's happening here. If Jesus really became the king of Israel, what would happen to them? I guarantee they wouldn't be saying, hey, Lord, can I be in your cabinet? Can I be your secretary of state? I don't think that's what happened. So, I think they had a fear of losing their power. I think that was part of it. Okay? Uh, also, they said this in, in John's Gospel, and they actually talked about um, uh, Lazarus being there as well, and they basically said concerning Jesus, their reaction was this, the whole world has gone after him. The whole world is following Jesus now. Here's something very interesting. I want you to look particularly in Matthew's Gospel. Remember at the beginning of Matthew, what are, who are we presented with? We are presented with Jesus who was born, and then in chapter 2, we see Jesus uh, who was uh, presented with gifts by who? The wise men, okay? The wise men come from the east, and they, they gave him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. As, as that happens, what happens when they found out, remember the wise men come to Herod in Jerusalem, and they say, where is he that is born king of the Jews? How did that make Herod feel? A little unnerved, right? Not just a little, a lot unnerved, okay? And, it's, and the Bible says in Luke or Matthew chapter 2 that the whole city was moved with him. They were shaken because of that news. And now, look with me in Matthew 21, here we are, in verse 10. And when he, when Jesus was coming in Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, who is this? 
So you have this. This is bookends of Jesus' life. At his birth, or shortly after, we see that the city was moved with the news of his coming as king. And now here at the end of his life, in the Passion Week, now again at the triumphal entry, the presentation, the messianic presentation, the city is moved again. They're shaken. No wonder the religious leaders were a little bit upset. Okay, very interesting. But here's the point. Oh, that they would believe in the coming king. Would they believe in the coming king? Well, let's look at the purpose of the, of the Palm Sunday. The purpose of Palm Sunday, was, of Jesus riding in Jerusalem, was to make public his claim to be the Messiah and the King of Israel. And not just to say, hey, I'm the Messiah, but remember this, that Jesus coming in this world didn't just happen uh, you know, at his birth and, and things like that. Remember, there's prophecies. So you go back about four or 500 years before Jesus was born. You have the prophet Zechariah. Zechariah 9.9 9 mentions this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, the colt of full of an ass. So as we see this here in, uh, in, in, um, in Zechariah's prophecy here, that the Messiah, the one who would come to rule and reign, it was as a cause of rejoicing. Matthew 21, we see rejoicing. Okay, you see the check marks. This is happening. But Jesus is doing that literally to fulfill this. He comes, though, on a donkey. This is what makes this surreal. And for those Jews who knew the scriptures and knew what the prophet said, by the way, Zechariah was buried just a little bit down the hill from where this is happening, just to put this in context. Okay? So Zechariah the prophet, he's buried just, a, I don't know, about a couple hundred feet, a little bit off, depending on... Now, the roads have changed from today from where they were 2,000 years ago. But nonetheless, you're in the same area where Zechariah, who prophesied that, and here it's coming to pass. This is one reason why a trip to Israel changes your life. Okay? So in doing this, Jesus fulfills this prophecy, and he comes riding on a donkey. But as he does this, he does this. We say Palm Sunday. It's a great day, the, first, uh, the tenth day of the month Nisan. But this is important because if you compare this with the book of Exodus, when the children of Israel were supposed to take a lamb for their households, the Passover lamb, they were supposed to take it on the tenth day. Choose a lamb without blemish on the tenth day of the first month, month Nisan. And you keep it for four days. And on the fourth day, the fourteenth day, you kill that lamb and you put the blood and you put it on the doorposts of your house. The tenth day is when you select a lamb. And by the way, if, and you ask the kids, if you keep a lamb around your house for you know one day is fine, two days maybe, but by the fourth day, I think most of us get a little attached to that lamb. So this was very important. But this year, this day was important because this was lamb selection day. The people coming down the Mount of Olives weren't there just because, oh, Jesus is coming, let's go and see him. They were coming to the temple as well to select their lamb for the sacrifice that was going to happen just a few days later. So Jesus is coming as the Lamb of God. John the Baptist, at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus came in as a lamb. The Bible says, you look here in verse... Um, uh, look with me in Matthew 20, verse 5. And he quotes this prophecy. Tell you the daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, called the foal of an ass. So the idea of meek is lowly, which we see here in, in uh, Zechariah 9, which means humble. He came in a very humble way. Jesus Christ, the king of kings and lord of lords, comes in not on a white horse, on a gallant stallion, coming into the city of Jerusalem as a conqueror, he comes in humbly. He's a humble king. This is important to know. I want us to kind of show you something interesting. So if you go east, uh, if you go to, to the right of the map there, that's where the Mount of Olives is. And you can see on the left, that square is the old city of Jerusalem. You go on the west side of the old city, and where I got it circled there in red, that is the Jaffa Gate. Jaffa Gate. Now, by the way, maybe, maybe we'll do like a one-time series on on the history of Jerusalem, because what you see here is not what it was in Jesus' time. It's changed a lot. The current walls you see there are only 500 years ago. They're really young. They're only 500 years, okay? <laughs> so you go back 2,000 years, it would be a little different. But nonetheless, there on the left, you'll see the Jaffa Gate. And this plays a very important part. In Jaffa Gate, you see the picture there on the right. It's the only entrance, or the only part of Jerusalem which is kind of wide open in that gap. And that happened back in, uh, in 1898, uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. He was the last 
uh, emperor of Germany. And uh, anyways, he was kind of a, well, he was a very complicated figure. If, you want just ha- if you're really bored and want to read about something really scandalous and all over the place, read Kaiser Wilhelm II. But nonetheless, in uh, 1898, he, he was meeting his wife, Augusta Victoria, in Jerusalem and meeting the Ottoman de- delegation. At this time in Israel, uh, it was under Ottoman rule, under Turkish rule. Okay, And it would be that way up until 1917. But anyways, he's coming there, and they're um, uh, commemorating the, the Church of the Redeemer that was being built and a few other uh, you know, social things that they're doing. But anyways, he has such a large entourage. He came on these, these great horses and steeds and carriages and just hundreds and actually over thousands of people that were in his entourage for he and his wife coming in here as Kaiser Wilhelm II coming in. And they said, how can we get in the old city? By the way, the old city of Jerusalem is very small. It's like a what, one square mile. You know, it's a very, very compact area. And so as he comes in, he's, they said, well, we need a, a grand entrance. So the Ottomans did him a favor. And so they actually cut out a piece of the wall. I'll go back to that picture here. On the right, they actually, the Ottomans cut out that piece. So you can see the actual gate there on the, on the right. The Ottomans cut out that, that slice right there so his entourage could enter into, this, into the city. That's what they did. That's back in 1898. And by the way, that relationship between the Germans and the Ottomans bonded them together because in just a couple years, they needed each other's help because in 1914, World War I started, and there were allies during that. Okay? So, interesting. Skip now to December of 1917, and a different leader comes in. That was General Edmund Allenby, a British general. You remember Lawrence of Arabia? How many of you have ever seen that? One of my favorite movies, okay? If you have five hours to kill, it's a great time. Okay. And, and a third, two-thirds are in the desert. All right, so anyways, uh, Lawrence of Arabia worked a little bit with General Allenby. Make, make uh, this happening here. When Allenby comes to Jerusalem in December of 1917, he comes to that very gate. I'll go back to that picture one more time. And he comes there, and what he does is very modest. Instead of coming in with his wide entourage, through that opening, he decides to dismount his horse and then walk in, basically humbly, as a show of modesty. It was probably more so a show, but nonetheless, as a show of modesty. And he comes to the Tower of David, which is just right around the corner from there. And there he makes a proclamation in six languages, actually, that uh, the British are now there and that there's no need to fear. They will help and protect uh, the flow of, um, of, of life and worship and things like that in the sacred sites. So, going back to these men, these two men entered Jerusalem in two different ways. Kaiser William, uh, Wilhelm was bombastic, extravagant, coming in. In fact, they even cut a piece of the wall for him to enter in. And then Ed- Edmund Allenby comes in, General Allenby, and he dismounts and humbly simply walks in. Not much fanfare other than that speech that he made. But nonetheless, a very important part uh, of this. And so, kind of interesting when we see this, the point of this is, is this, that the point is this, that kings and kingdoms have entered into Jerusalem over the years, and they have come and gone. The question is this, the king of kings was now entering in Jerusalem at the triumphal entry 2,000 years ago. And will Israel, will the Jewish people, and the world recognize the true king, the prince of peace? That's the real question. We now see that Jesus, and now in, in uh, Luke's gospel, actually, let's go ahead and turn there. Really quick, Luke 19. And we read here, this is the part of the account of the triumphal entry. But as Jesus makes his way down the, the, um, the Mount of Olives, he comes and he weeps over Jerusalem. He comes and weeps over Jerusalem. It says here in verse 41, And when, G- and when he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. He weeps, weeps over Jerusalem. Remember that Jesus, he actually wept over Lazarus. Jesus wept. The shortest verse of the Bible. Okay? Uh, uh, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. Jesus wept there for Lazarus. It was kind of an internal grief. And we would definitely understand it. When Jesus comes here, the Greek word that's used here for weeping is like an inconsolable, like a sobbing, if you will. And that's exactly what happens. There is a church that was built not very long ago called the Dominus Flevit, and it means our Lord wept in Latin. And it marks the traditional site of this moment. The church's design has the appearance of a teardrop, which reminds us of the tears of Jesus. 
And so what these tears were, though, when Jesus came and he saw these multitudes thronging, saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, this weeping here was really an expression of lost opportunity. They lost that opportunity. They lost the day of their visitation, is the idea. Jewish pilgrims, like I said, they made their way to the temple, singing and saying, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. By the way, that's not just any day. We sing that song. It's talking about this. But this was a day of messianic presentation. They, waved, they showed their garments. They waved palm branches. They wanted to deliver, but not from their sins, but simply from Rome. Jesus wept over the city, looking to the future, because in a few days, the angry crowds would switch their tone from Hosanna, save us, to crucify him. Jesus knew that even Jerusalem would suffer a greater fate 40 years later when Jerusalem would be destroyed by the Romans in the year 70 AD. And he cried these deep, sorrowful tears because many would not believe him. They missed the moment. That's the important thing. Palm Sunday, I think it's easy for us to miss the moment. It's easy to get on the rallying cry, wave our palm branches, shout Hosanna, do Jesus chants, whatever it may be. But I feel we miss the moment when we fail to believe on the king who's presented before us. They miss the moment. I pray we won't as well. Jesus here, though, shows his gentle heart in the face of impending judgment. As we see this here, Jesus' first coming was to conquer hearts and minds. To conquer hearts and minds. His first coming was to redeem us by his precious blood. Jesus didn't come to conquer us from sin. He came to conquer, conquer our hearts and minds from sin. Praise God for that. So, at the first coming, Christ is rejected. At a second coming, he'll be accepted. And so, there will be another Palm Sunday. Another Palm Sunday is what? When Jesus comes to this earth again, the Bible says in Zechariah 14, then the Lord shall go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the west and towards, or towards the east and towards the west. And there shall be a great valley, and half the mountain shall remove towards the south, or north, and half of it towards the south. So when we see this, this is what you see today. If you're in Jerusalem, you see the Mount of Olives. And this is, again, the same place where Jesus came down. It looked a little different 2,000 years ago. But you still had graves there, Okay. But when Jesus comes back at the second Palm Sunday, when he returns in glory in Revelation 19, by the way, he's not going to come on a donkey, he's kind of going to come on a white horse and, and those with him, okay? He will come in this mountain. The landscape is going to change dramatically. So I challenge you. I had a, a pastor friend of mine. He says, I have no interest in going to Israel. I'll wait till the millennium. I says, hey, you've got to be, do the before and after trip, okay? <laughs> so that was our challenge to him. So the landscape's going to change. But one day, Jesus will return to Jerusalem along the same path, and the prophecy will be fulfilled. The stone which the builders refused to become the head of the corner. So the challenges for us today is this. Don't lose sight. Don't lose sight of what is going on with Palm Sunday. It's very, like, it can be very distracting, and sometimes the business, but take a moment and look carefully at Jesus. Listen to what he says. Listen to what's going around, but believe with your heart upon Jesus Christ. One day he will be returning as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So the, the message of Palm Sunday is simply this, that the King is coming. The first time he came to redeem us from sin. When he comes again, he will redeem the world to himself. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I challenge each and every one of us this day and on every day to believe in the coming King. He is worthy to be praised. Amen. Hosanna. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. So anyways, praise the God for that. Praise God for his word. Pray this has been a blessing for each and every one of us today. I challenge us here today. I know this is a cozy group because of the weather. Again, our services have been changed a little bit today. And so, but uh, uh, we, we rejoice in what the Lord has done for us. And I pray we take this treasure in our heart. If you're here today, though, I do challenge you. If you're here today without Jesus Christ, you don't know for sure about your salvation, your relationship with Jesus Christ. Understand that Jesus came to this world. Yes, he came as king, but he came to conquer your heart. He came to die on a cross for you to pay the price as the Passover lamb. The Bible says in Exodus, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Do you have the blood of Christ applied to your life? I pray if you've never done that today, please get that settled. Get that settled. That is eternal significance. 
And when you understand who Jesus Christ is and trust in him and believe on him for salvation, your life is forever changed. And that meaning of Hosanna, save us. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord will have greater meaning for you. I pray each of us can grow today in his grace. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that we've had here together. Thank you, Lord, for this Palm Sunday. Lord, I ask that you would, be, you would just bless this time. Thank you for what we've learned and what we've encountered in your word. And Lord, help us to believe in the coming King. Lord, I do pray again if there's someone here or someone watching online today, Lord, that is unsure of their, their salvation, Father, that you would just uh, work in their lives in a great way. Help them know that you are real and help them know that you are there to save. Lord, we thank you for this time. Bless now this invitation, this time of meditation, Father. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have Justin come and lead us in a song right now. So you do it again here at Victory Baptist. The altar is always open here to, to worship and respond obediently to the Lord. Uh, I invite you all to stand, if you're able to, as we have a closing hymn. Let's respond by rejoicing that the Lord is King. Let's sing hymn number 228. Rejoice, the Lord is King.